morning, everybody. My name's Nick Scott. I'm the managing partner of Brodies. We were um, hoping today, being the 11th of June, that it would be the first day of our 2020 Brodies Tennis Invitational. Um, these, of course, are not normal circumstances, but undeterred by that, we are determined to try and give everyone who's a tennis fan um, a little small taste um, of tennis to sustain us until we get to the real thing. Um, we've also been maintaining our support for the game of tennis um, during this COVID time, and you may start to pick up some things on the TV and in the newspapers today of, of a small initiative we've been doing with Judy Murray. Um, more about that a bit later this morning. Uh, we wanted to bring you some of the legends that you would have seen in person in Edinburgh uh, today had we been playing our event. These guys have contributed to the game of tennis in the UK and also here in Scotland. Um, they've played as players, as coaches, captains, and they've also been involved in the um, infrastructure of the kind of support of the amateur and the professional game. Um, so just that housekeeping point, um, you're all on mute, but please do fire your questions in through the chat function and I will try and get to as many as I can. Um, don't be shy, um, only we can see the questions. Um, so feel free to ask anything you wish. I'm not, I can't promise I will ask everything that gets asked, but I will do my best. Um, and lastly, there are no fire drills. Um, during this webinar. If you hear a fire alarm, it's probably in your house and I suggest that you go and check it out. So I said um, at the beginning, our, our guests this morning um, have been players, coaches and captains. Um, so it is with great pleasure that I introduce you to Tim Henman, Colin Fleming and Leon Smith. Um, Tim first, uh, of course, needs no introduction, but for those of you who have lost your um, or misplaced your Tim Almanac, um, uh, let me just give you some career highlights. Um, Tim had 11 career titles. His world ranking at its highest was number four in the world. He was a regular feature in semi-finals of Grand Slams. He's played in Davis Cup. Um, and of course, um, the thing I remember most for, he was responsible for some of the most enthralling but also nerve-shredding Wimbledon semi-finals of the late 90s and the 2000s. Um, he has also more recently um, taken on the role as um, captain of the British team in the inaugural ATP Cup in Australia. And I'm sure we'll have some questions about that. A time, it seems almost a different world when the only thing we get about were rampant forest fires. Um, Colin, um, Colin Fleming, a, a professional tennis player specialized in doubles. Um, he too featured in the later stages of Grand Slam, Slams. He represented Great Britain in the Davis Cup and won Commonwealth gold was national coach of Scotland and is currently the Fed Cup captain. Um, he was also scheduled to be the tournament director of today's event, um, had we been playing the actual event. And we'll look forward to working with Colin next year when we try and bring our, our tennis event back in reality. Um, and then thirdly, Leon Smith, um, as uh, everyone will recognize, the hugely successful captain of Britain's Davis Cup. Um, he led the team to victory in 2015 um, when he was appointed um, captain in 2010. He was the youngest captain since the 1970s and he's also had senior positions in the women's game and um, so I'm hoping he, he can talk, us to, talk to us as Colin can a fair bit about that side of the of the profession. Um, in his career he's also been coached to some of the world's finest players um, including Andy Murray both during his junior career and also at times during his professional career. So good morning everybody. Um, can I introduce you to our guests? Good morning. Thanks for Good morning. Good, right. Um, like I said, I'm hoping I'm going to lose direction of the questions fairly quickly, but I have plenty of my own for, for the team. And so I thought I would start with the, the simplest and the easiest. Guys, how has your lockdown been? So Tim, do you want to kick us off? Well, lockdown really has, has, has been okay. Um, we don't live um, in the city. We live out in a small village, so we've got a bit of space. Um, my three daughters are 17, 15 and 12, so they've been very sort of capable of getting on with their remote learning with their schools and and um you know so from that point of view um it, it's been okay it has been it has been strange uh times but with the you know when the weather was so good we've all been pretty active getting out and about um played a fair amount of family tennis um which has had its moments we haven't had too many arguments but um it, it's it's been okay so you know fingers crossed we're um you know, moving through this and we can get back to normality as, as quickly as possible. And do you still win the family tennis? Well, it depends. Yeah, I'm still fairly competitive, but if, if I want a, a more amicable sort of evening meal um, with everyone <laughs> in harmony, sometimes I have to, you know, let the odd point go here and there. But I, I find that 
find that difficult. Very good, very good. And Colin, you've got, um, if I understand it right, you have a teacher in the house. So how's the homeschooling going at your end? Yeah, I'm sitting in a, in a classroom, so to speak, um, if you like. Yeah, my wife Gemma is a, a primary school teacher, so that's come in handy, um, especially with my daughter, who she, she's only five, so uh, in, in primary one. But um, yeah, she's got her her learning to do and, and my wife's been able to, to stay on top of that. And um, I actually take my hat off. You know, she's been she'd been working pretty much full on, you know, setting all the tasks online. They're all emails are pinging in nonstop, marking them, reviewing them, doing videos. So the way the way I think that profession has been able to adapt has has, has uh, been very impressive. Um, from my point of view, it's been very quiet. Um, obviously, you know, not being on the court, um, no professional events been taking place. I do a bit of commentary as well, so none of that's been happening. But um, yeah, I think I think like like many people, I've sort of um, got back to basics, if you like. I've been been out in the garden, you know, getting getting my my hands dirty. Got back into a bit of running just to have some routine and. Delighted as a tennis player and a golfer that they were two of the first sports back in, in recent weeks as well. So, um, yeah, to be honest, the last couple of weeks has been a bit of a holiday for me. So, um, not too bad. Can't complain. Well, I was going to ask you later which sport you're looking to the return to most excitedly, whether it was um, tennis or golf. But um, we'll maybe leave that for later in the, in the, the Q&A. And, Le and Leon, um, fellow Edinburgh resident, we've obviously had some pretty decent weather in the last few weeks. Have you been, been out and about? Have you managed to play any tennis? Yeah, actually, I mean, we did surprisingly get some good weather. Um, I often on my phone have the screenshot of London weather and Edinburgh weather. Mm -hmm. And I just look at think, how can we be that close and be that far apart uh, in temperature? Uh, but we actually got we got quite a good run of it, which is great. So, yeah, just like Colin saying, been out in the garden, but I'm also in the same situation. Uh, we've got three fairly young children, 13, 10 and 7, all school age. And also, like on my wife, Laura, is a school teacher, which is an absolute okay. godsend uh, to being able to just marshal uh, the, the, the homeschooling. Um, and from my end, I've been, you know, I've been really busy with work. I mean, it's been, it's been full on, very different challenges, not one we would have wanted to be in, but it's, um, uh, it's one we've had to adapt to. And it's, it's been challenged, but in a good way, it's brought a lot of us together uh, across different departments, different functions in a way that probably wouldn't have happened before. Um, because of the nature of the, the tasks and the actions you've got to um, work through. But so work has been busy. Um, but I have seen Colin play a lot of tennis. You know, we're, we've both been using the, the local club. So I've been down most days with, with my kids playing a bit of tennis or paddle. And Colin, I'm surprised he can even move today with the amount of five setters he's had the last few days. Uh, he did look a, a little bit weary yesterday, uh, as I saw him yesterday evening at the club, but he battled on anyway. And has he been getting beaten by juniors or by seniors? Um, I'll let him answer that one, but he, he's listening. <laughs> he's still he's still it in the ball. Great. I mean, it's so impressive. It's, it's you know good fun practice matches that a bunch of uh, very good Scottish players have been um, uh, putting on at the local club, uh, and there's been a bit of drizzle in the evening, so it's made it very heavy, slow conditions, which I think has made it even more challenging for for Flembo. Yes, yeah, yes, it's, 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 uh, I can confirm it's not been easy, guys. Um, <laughs> played a little match play of some good players in the Edinburgh area. Um, just drafting a letter this morning, actually, to Neurofen looking for a sponsorship. <laughs> just, just to try and save the bills a little bit because it's been a tough few days. But um, yeah, we, we, we live and learn. It's been great to play with some of the young guys and, and hopefully, uh, yeah, maybe, maybe a good experience for them as well. Very, very good. Well, that, that, so let's start on that then, the return to tennis. Um, and particularly, the, let's talk about the, the professional game. So we've seen the start of, um, you know, some tournaments, most of them national events. Um, so we've obviously we've got, and I see this question's already coming in about um, Jamie Murray's tournament. Um, I think Novak's being organised some in, in some of his, um, a, for some of his kind of national colleagues. Um, are we looking forward to those those tournaments coming? Do you think? I mean, Colin, let's start with you. Do you think that's going to see a resurgence of national-based events? Well, yeah. I mean. To answer your, your question, very much looking forward to it. I, I mean, joking aside, this little event I've been involved in in, in Edinburgh, at obviously at a, a lower level, it, it's just the, the amount of passion uh, and, and just joy to be back on the court and competing. Obviously, the, we're not competing for anything, no prizes, no money, no ranking points. It's, it's kind of back to that why you got into tennis in the first place and, and loved playing. And I think that's going to be very apparent when these events kick off and you'll see Andy Murray, Jamie Murray, obviously, he's done a great job organising. 
Kyle Edmund, all, all these top players. And, you know, there's going to be an event on the, the women's side as well. Um, it's going to be very different, but something very new, uh, very refreshing, I think, to just see people competing for, for the love of the game, essentially. Yeah. And, um, you know, something I'm interested to hear about, because just, just probably before my time, but there was always a, a British Nationals, the inaugural British Nationals event. It's yeah. been an event, you know, I'm sure... Tim will have a lot to say about that. We would, would have competed in it a number of times. And it may well bring events like that back into the calendar as a permanent fixture as people start to see the, you know, the value in them again. Very good. And well, Tim, just to take that point, I mean, obviously we'll come on to Wimbledon um, and their plans you're heavily involved in, in the organisation side of that. But let's just talk about the, um, the ones that are immediately coming up or for decisions to be made. US Open obviously got a decision to make um, next week. Um, uh, what's your impressions of the chances of getting Grand Slam tennis back um, this year? Well, th there's no doubt that it's it's massively challenging. Um, when, when you look at uh, the US Open, um, obviously, I think first and foremost, the challenges from the USDA's point of view is, you know, they, they own that event. They have no insurance policy. They are absolutely desperate to have an event in any way, shape or form. But the logistics of it being a global game, trying to get players from all over the world to New York, being able to um, look after their health and well-being, where they're going to stay. It, it's, it's massively challenging. And, and um, you know, Leon touched on it. We, we, we have to adapt in, in any uh, business, profession, walk of life. Uh, everybody's adapting and, and, uh, and tennis is no different. So, um, you know, the players have different thoughts and feelings. You can, you can hear some of the very top ones, Djokovic, Nadal, obviously Federer is now out for the rest of the year, but there's a reluctance um, to travel at this stage, whereas some of the um, players a little bit further down the pecking order, they're desperate for the opportunity to get out there to compete for not only ranking points, but prize money. So um, they're looking to make a decision, I think, in the next... Uh, I think it could be on 15th of June, which is uh, obviously on Monday, or it may be delayed until the 1st of July. But, um, you know, I, I, really, I, I really don't know what's going to happen. So we'll, we'll just have to wait and see. And crowds, Leon, I mean, it's, it's on, you know, a career spent a lot in the Davis Cup. It's impossible, impossible to imagine Davis Cup without the home team with their crowd shouting. It was such a big part, of course, of, of the British team's success, wasn't it? The, the atmosphere and the crowd. I mean, tennis, professional tennis without crowds. What's your take on that? I mean, it's, uh, I think it's been interesting. I've, I tried to watch a few of the German Bundesliga matches um, that were on and I actually found it quite, it was interesting to watch at the start just to see the players reaction, especially when, you know, a goal was scored and, um, but also that tempo of the game that the crowd often gives in football wasn't there. So it urges the, the team to go. But in tennis, I guess it's a little bit different. Um, you know, Davis Cup's one thing, but normally week to week in tournaments, it's, it's, um, it's a bit quiet. Obviously, it's, it's quiet between, uh, during the points. Uh, it's not as partisan. So maybe it doesn't play as much uh, as a role as it would do in, in team sports. Um, so, you know, but, but without fans, it's still, especially for the the best players, the elite players at the top of the game, it's a different feeling for them. And I can, I can understand why they perhaps aren't overly enthusiastic about walking into an environment that is so alien from what they're used to because they're not yeah. playing for the financial gains. They're playing for that moment of what it feels like, you know, making that moment in history again. And I can yeah. imagine it's very different as you go down the rankings for, for different needs, obviously. Yeah. And Tim, then let's take you back to Wimbledon then. So obviously um, a, you have quite a role there in the organisation of the event and, and the running of Wimbledon as, a, as it's as the venue. So um, obviously the difficult decision to postpone this year's tournament, no attempt, I presume, with British weather to try and bring it back in 2020. So um, just talk to us about the, the decision making you had to go through there and, and plans for, for next year's event. Yeah, well, um, it was amazing um, being part of the committee. It was amazing how quickly, um, you know, the whole landscape changed. And, and I remember the first um, sort of decision uh, externally, but within tennis was Indian Wells was cancelled and, and all the players were on site. Um, I think at that stage there was only um, one COVID case in, in the whole of California. And I remember when I heard that decision being made, I thought, 
surely that has to be a, a, an overreaction. Um, but then things started to, to move so rapidly. It was then the next week that Roland Garros announced that they would be moving to the end of September. And I think from Wimbledon's point of view, um, you know, that was sort of, I think we were at sort of March, end of March at that stage. And Wimbledon and the committee were, you know, very keen to sort of sit back and, and see what will happen. And, and normally, um, you know, Wimbledon don't make any announcements until the end of April, um, which is the, the spring press conference. So Wimbledon felt they had another sort of four or five weeks to survey the landscape. The following week, um, the Olympics was postponed. And all of a sudden, you just felt that, you know, the spotlight was coming more and more um onto Wimbledon and, and when you understand the logistics of the of the sort of pre-tournament build and what has to actually take place it was becoming more and more evident that uh you know the championships for 2020 were were in jeopardy and and uh, when you looked at playing behind closed doors um if you play with no spectators and you're trying to do the social distancing bit mm -hmm. you still need 5,000 people on site when you talk about officials, line judges, ball boys and ball kids, uh, the court coverers, um, a certain amount of security. So, you know, that really wasn't an option. So, uh, yeah, amazing um, how quickly it moved and, and, and obviously a huge decision that, that wasn't taken lightly. And when you reflect the last time that the, um, the championships was, was cancelled was for the Second World War, then I think it, you know, really emphasises, um, you know, the situation that we're in. Yeah, and and the potential, of course, of events or tournaments without a full playing squad. So, I mean, is there, um, Colin, maybe one for you. I can see some questions coming in about what this might mean for how um, events are structured in the future in the calendar, for, you know, the tennis calendar. And also a question I see, um, if you care for a technical one, um, a, with no umpires in the first kind of COVID, post-COVID um, events, is Hawkeye now going to become a bigger feature of how the, the game is regulated? Yeah, well, I, I think these are good questions. Um, you know, there's no doubt that there's going to be changes to, well, changes to the world, to the, the way we live, and, and tennis is no different. Um, it's not, not immune to, to, to the impact of that. Um, in terms of Hawkeye, we've obviously hit, had an event at the ATP Next Gen Finals where they've used purely Hawkeye for, for the line calling. I guess it's an option. It's an expensive option. So maybe the, you know, the bigger tournaments might be able to, to look at that kind of thing, but the smaller sort of, you know, level professional events, there's, you know, they struggle to break even as it is with ticket sales, with crowds. So it's very difficult to take that away and add extra expense. But, and also it touches on the, the, the whole crowd element, because I actually think that it, it, it took that away in that event, just having electronic calling that you couldn't actually question. I think Hawkeye challenges are, are a great feature when you want to bring a crowd into a match and you, you have the heartbeat and you have some, some level of human error. I think yep. it's great. You know, think back of some of the memories of tennis. It's, it's John McEnroe arguing with umpires and line judges. And, you know, I don't think that's a huge element, but, whether events will change, I mean, there's been big discussions throughout the lockdown um, from a tennis point of view, you know, first and foremost about merging the ATP and the WTA. Um, that yep. would be a significant thing in, in, in the world of tennis. And I think events are going to have to innovate and, and look at ways they can first and foremost survive and then start to, to prosper in, in, in a, new, a, new, um, a new world, if you like. Yeah, indeed. And that was a question I was going to ask you, Leon, is... Um... The, the discussion about you know the potential of the, of um, merging combining some of these the national kind of competitions. I mean, have you got a view on on the merits of that or where you think it might land? Well, specifically around national based competition. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, um, a Davis Cup. You know, okay. The ITF, the ITF are saying. Well, I think um, you know, as Colin's saying, I think there's going to be a. It, Everyone's taking a stop check now of, of what can happen in the future, whether that's uh, being more innovative around events. I mean, there's obviously there's a lot of work to get done around, you know, increasing the fan base and, and bring it to different generations. I mean, supposedly the average age of the tennis fan is around 61 years old. So clearly tennis needs to start looking at ways to enter into different markets, different fan bases, try and engage with younger kids to make tennis. You know, it's, it's cool and it's a great sport, but they need to... You know, I can tell with my kids, it's it's shorter bursts of something. You know, I you know I've been involved in Davis Cup where they're amazing moments, but you know we've had matches with match days where it's been 11 hours of tennis. 
You know, there's just zero chance that my kids can come and watch 11 hours of tennis. You know, they'd struggle to watch an hour and a half of tennis. They like the doubles day best at Davis Cup because that's the day they want to come because it's one match, it's a bit shorter, but it's, it's trying to make sure that we get younger people engaged. Otherwise, you know, tennis will lose its way to other sports. That's, that, and that's really important that we, we look at different things. I've enjoyed the team competition to watch. I mean, I've, obviously I've been involved in Davis Cup, but I absolutely loved, you know, watching Tim and the guys play in the ATP Cup. Um, and I don't know whether that's something in the future that, you know, that those two the events merge and become one, or whether there's actually room to have more team competitions, because as Tim, I'm sure, would testify, the players absolutely love being part of a team. You know, Colin's yeah. played as part of teams. We've all led the teams. We've been, you know, Colin and Tim both played in the teams, and it's and it's great. So I don't see why we can't have more team competitions rather than even merging them. I think there's there's merit to look at the calendar because again, when you think of young people watching it, they aspire to teams as well. And it's yeah. it, it's um, I, I find watching the ATP Cup, for example, unbelievable viewing, brilliant excitement. No, indeed. Um, and that, that, was, that, that is, of course, one of the challenges, isn't it? Fitting things into the calendar. And I guess one of the things we will see at, after this is the, whether or not there's a change to the order of, of the events over the course of the year. Um, well, let's, let's turn a bit to the players themselves then. There's quite a few questions popping in there about um, what all this means for the, for the players themselves. Um, a, let's start, um, I guess, Colin, let's start with you. Um, so, there were obviously before the lockdown on the men's side of the the game, there were still the um, the old established stars who had all the grand slams. Um, what do you think? You know, does it does a period of rest help the old guys? Does it hinder them? They're, they're time to recuperate. Um, we obviously had Rogers' news yesterday about his knee operation. What's your take on that? Yeah, I think um, that's going to be an interesting one when we get back there. Yeah, that that news about Federer, who you know won't play again until uh, twenty twenty one, regardless of of what happens. Um, you could argue it came at a reasonably good time for Andy Murray as well. Obviously, he's mm. been struggling a bit with injury and will have that extra time to recover. I think I think once we do get back on the match court, I think the, the sort of older, more experienced players will have an advantage in, in some ways in that the experience they've got, they probably practice a bit less at the best of times anyway, know how to manage their bodies, know how to you know, cope with and stay calm under the fact that maybe they haven't quite had the same preparation that they're used to or, you know, so they, I would expect able to get the level back from that point of view, but I think physically more of a challenge for them to get that speed back, to get that sharpness where the younger guys will be able to ramp it up probably a bit quicker. And that, that's a key consideration, I think, for these professional athletes. At the end of the day, you can't just go from very little or, or, or almost nothing to just training the way you were it's got to be a slow gradual build up yeah. and possibly the younger guys are going to be able to to you know steepen that curve and get back to their level a little bit quicker but like i say the experienced guys will have that you know court craft and a little bit of knowledge that maybe can carry them through some moments when they're they're under pressure they're feeling a bit underprepared but they've got that bank of winning behind them and, and, and can draw on that so it's gonna be very interesting to see who, who deals with it best when we get back on that match court so I haven't got any tips yet for the bookies from that answer yet, Colin. No, I'm keeping it very vague, <laughs> deliberately vague. I don't want anyone knocking on my door. <laughs> so Tim, about the, the, those younger players that Colin was hinting to, sits the press and team, and they're look, we've all been waiting for them, one of them to make the break, haven't we? Um, I mean, what does this mean for them? Are some of them known to be faster out of the blocks than, than some of their colleagues? Well, I, I think it's, you know, it's, it's such sort of unprecedented circumstances. It is, it is difficult to know. And, um, you know, I, I think uh, across the board, whether you're talking about the older generation or this younger generation, I think they'll be frustrated because it's missed opportunities. You know, there was, you know, Dominic Team playing extremely well in, in Australia. You, you know, Zverev has been knocking on the door for a while. Tsitsipas is, is playing some, some great tennis. You sort of feel like, they're trying to build that momentum to, to have the opportunity against the, the big three of Federer, Nadal and Djokovic. But when you go to the other end of the, the spectrum in terms of those careers, yeah, I agree with Colin. I think mentally they have the experience, they will be able to deal with it. But I think physically at the age of, you know, sort of 33, 34 for, for Djokovic and Nadal, but then Federer at 38, you know, 39 when he returns, I think that's hard because, as we all know, as you get older, um, it becomes more challenging physically. Your recovery takes um, a little bit longer. And when you're 
you know, potentially diving into, you know, big matches, Grand Slam matches, five set matches. I, I think that is going to be, um, it's going to be tough, tough physically. So um, for me, I, I'm just keen that we can get um, the, the, the tours uh, back up and running. And, and um, Leon was talking about the fan base, which is important, that's sort of external. I think internally, this is a really important time for tennis. I think the, the leadership um, of tennis is, has not been good. You know, there are too many different bodies. We talk about a merger between the ATP, the WTA. We have the ITF looking after the Davis Cup. The Grand Slams are not governing bodies, but they, they are major influencers uh, in the game. So you can talk to seven different groups. And I think it's very important that those seven work better now. And, and we use the opportunity in a crisis. They say you should never turn down those opportunities. And I think yep. we need to make sure that in, you know, whether it's 2021, you know, when things are starting to get back to normal, the game of tennis um, is, is really collectively in a better place. And have you seen any signs yet of some form of shape to that emerging yet? From, are, are those conversations already going on? They're, they're, they're sort of trying to, to happen. And again, the challenges of, um, you know, not being able to travel and, and really get, you know, everyone in the same room. We, we've all um, probably had our fair share, our fill of, of Zoom calls or whatever you want to, to call it. But I, I think it, in, it will be better when, you know, everybody can be in the same room around the table, understand different challenges. Um, because we do, we have uh, one common theme and it's a great theme, the, the game of tennis. And we've got to work together rather than at times sort of compete against each other. And so, um, yeah, I do feel um, sort of excited and positive and, and, and optimistic that that can be done in the future. Right. Okay. And I've got, I'm going to have to ask it because I can see it at least three times in my, in my question bar. Um, do we think that Andy's going to emerge from this fit and able to win another Grand Slam? Who wants to go first? Tim wants to answer that one. <laughs> I was hoping that you might have seen him a bit more. I saw, I, I was with Andy at the National Tennis Centre at Roehampton just before lockdown. And, uh, you know, he really looked like he was sort of ramping things up. His movement was looking freer and faster. Um, he's always going to hit the tennis ball well. That's never going to be a problem. Um, so, yeah, I, th I think when you reflect, um, it seems a long time ago, but at the end of last year when he won Antwerp, the tour event, you know, an amazing achievement, but he was still, um, still kind of playing on one leg. You know, he had one leg that still was a lot weaker, needed to, to strengthen. And, and um, you know, I'm sure that's improved uh, a lot. So I'm, I'm always positive and optimistic with his uh, mindset, his competitive spirit. Um, you know, I really think he can get back to a very high level. The, the biggest challenge, no doubt, is when he's playing in Grand Slams, he's playing best of five set matches, against the other best players in the world, um, and he has to recover. Um, I think that's an unknown for, every, for, for everyone. I don't think he knows, um, his team know, won't know, and, and I certainly don't know, but hopefully he can give himself the opportunity to try and find out. Good, and um, Leon, just on the women's game, let's touch, touch on that for a bit. So again, uh, um, uh, unlike the men's game, um, a, a whole range of people winning Grand Slams and coming to the top of the of top of that field. Um, again, your impressions of what this will, um, you know, what this this kind of pause in the game will have done to the to who will be successful in the the next year or so. Well, I think that's that's what's it's so different across the the men's game and the women's game is just the turnover of of Slam champions, um, mm. and I think. You know, on the one hand, that's really good for the women's side because, and spe especially for the playing field, because they've all got this belief that as soon as the tournament starts, they've got a chance. They've got a chance of going on to win. When the men's side, it's just so concrete around the top three, and it's so difficult to break that uh, monopoly. But the women's side, you know, we, there's so many exciting players. If you look at Osaka, you look at Ash Barty, did some unbelievable things, especially the way that, that she plays the game, an all-court player, which is great to see because for for quite a few years, there was uh, a certain style in the women's game, which was, you know, very much baseline orientated, uh, hitting quite straight lines through the court. And then, and maybe there was a bit of a gap from when, if you remember back to Justine Henna and the way that she was playing with a lot of variety, even Moresmo at the time. Um, 
obviously Williams dominating incredibly well and, and, and bringing athleticism like it's never been seen before. Yep. And then it was really refreshing seeing some new winners come out. And I think especially when you get someone like Ash Barty, who, you know, she's not that big, she's not that tall, you know, she's fairly small, but just so skillful and have that, that court craft, uh, tactical nous is something different. So there's a, there's a lot of strength uh, around the women's game for that. I think it's, it's because of what's happened the last few years, it's actually very difficult to predict who's going to come out and dominate um, moving forward because of the turnover of, of champions. Yeah, indeed. Okay, well, can, can we sit with you, Leon? I mean, I, I, I said at the beginning, um, each of you had um, quite marked influences on Davis Cup, um, ATP, Fed Cup. Um, let's talk about, about those events. So if we stick with you, Leon, initially, obviously, tremendously successful captain there. Just talk to us about the role of the captain in the Davis Cup, about taking players who are spending most of their, their year, of course, playing for themselves as individuals and then creating that sense of the teamwork and the, and the cohesion. So do you want to just talk to us a little bit about your experiences there? Yeah, I mean, it's, um, I guess I'd, I think it's an advantage when I, when I took on the role, I also um, took on the role as head of men's tennis, which mm-hmm. uh, is more of a management role around whether it's funding, wild cards, supporting coaches, putting on programs, what tournaments we run. But it allowed me to be full time in the role, which helped a lot, where other captains were in the past part time, maybe, you know, twelve to fifteen weeks a year type thing to go to the major events, watch the players. I could go to a lot more tournaments and, and part of the role is I think has always been most important is to know the players really well. Um, mm-hmm. get to know them get to know them as people first and foremost. Um, build that relationship, build trust, um, show that you care about them, um, and they're not just someone that comes in to, to do a job for you. It's not. It's about being a great team. I think, you know, Colin's played in teams that um, I've, I've been involved in, and and you know, he, he might be better placed at what it feels like being a player in that. But it's about spending time with them. Um, so there's that element of it. Uh, we had a range of players when I first took over. We were really quite far down. Uh, the divisions were about to go down to, I think, uh, Division 3 of the competition, which was uh, very low. And we had our, our first match against Turkey. Um, and we had uh, we had a team, the singles players were playing in what's called the Challenger Tour. They weren't playing in the main tour. There's mm-hmm. James Ward, Jimmy Baker. So it was about going out to all sorts of different places to go and see them play. Um, not around the main tour. And then as we started to to move up the levels, um, I think what was nice is the players themselves started to improve. And I think the Davis Cup journey in the early, sort of the first four or five years of it gave players, especially when Andy wasn't playing in the team, gave players a chance to play big matches over five sets um, against really good players. And they started to get some good results. And then, you know, you know if you look at the team, now that whether it's in Davis Cup or whether what Tim had for the ATP Cup, I mean the ranking difference from when I started my journey on it ten years ago, if Andy didn't play, the average ranking of the singles players was about 240, 250. Yep. And now we've got, you know, obviously players like Dan Evans doing brilliant stuff, Cam Norrie, Kyle Edmonds, and we've had so many great doubles players um, that are at the top of the game. New faces that come through. Obviously, Jamie has been, you know, a mainstay, and then, you know. Mm-hmm. You look at Joe Salisbury winning Australian Open doubles at the start of this year, got to number two in the world. It's been it's been an incredible amount of depth in the doubles. So, um, you know, so that that's the role: getting to know the players, getting to know your opponents. It's unlike any other tournament. It's not like an, you wait for the draw sheet to come out. Um, you know, we hope that Davis Cup will go ahead in November again in Madrid this year. Yep. Um, and we already know who we're playing. We're playing Czech Republic in France. So you can scout as much as you want, get a lot of information you know, about the players. Um, um, so that's the other side of it. Um, and the other thing is, I think what we, you have to do as well is is engage with the fans a lot. That's something we've tried to do a lot. Um, yep. It's changed a lot. That the, the role has changed in the last uh, year as well. I mean, when we were playing in the, the old format, which was home and away ties, you know, when when we made semi-finals, you know, a few times obviously we reached final. Um, that was four lots of ties each year. Basically, mm-hmm. you're, you're with each other 10 to 14 days, so actually you ended up spending like eight weeks of a team together, which was really nice. It felt, it was a really big chunk of the calendar. 
where now you know we automatically qualified for next year's finals from making semi-finals last year you know you're not together as a team until really then so it has it has changed a little bit more in the last couple of years the role very good long answer yeah. sorry no no fascinating and i also got in the middle there that um tim he's teed up teed it up for you for the atp so um so talk to us about um australia in january and what it was like to be there talk to us about playing frankly with forest fires around you well, that's right. I mean, it does. It seems such a long time ago. And, and um, you know, uh, it's, it's a slightly different format. Um, but the, the captain is actually decided by um, the number one player. And uh, it was Andy Murray who was using his protected ranking to get into the event. Um, he obviously didn't end up playing, but, but asked me to, to be captain. I hadn't really given it a massive amount of thought, but... Um, um, when I did, uh, it was it was something that I was keen to do. Um, it was a new event. Um, it had something like eight of the top 10, 23 of the top 30 playing, uh, big prize money in, in a great country. And, and um, you know, when we got out there, um, these bushfires that were, were happening in, in Australia were, were absolutely horrific. There was, um, you know, significant loss of life. There was, um, you know, hundreds of thousands if not millions of animals that were killed and and um you know it was a, it was a global story and you, you sort of now reflect five six months on but i i sort of think that you know these these bushfires are a dif- distant memory because of of what's what's happened um around the world now with with the COVID. but um atb cup was a fantastic event very well run um i really enjoyed you know, connecting with the team. I haven't uh, been in that environment for for a long, long time. And, and um, you know, for me, the challenge, again, going back to the sport, um, Davis Cup is an unbelievable event, has been around for, for you know, um, over 100 years. Um, huge participation. Um, to have these two events six weeks apart um, with the same players and pretty much the same format just does not make sense and this is where I think the game has to you know work be- better to find you know how we can you know give the best opportunities to the players the fans uh, you know television audience sponsors um, so that we can you know grow the game more and more and, and I don't necessarily have an answer to that but um, you know that would be at the pretty high up on my list of things that we need to um, uh, to try and sort out. Can I, can I ask a question just on that? Is that okay if I, I jump in? I mean, of course. you've got two, two captains here and it's different. The, the formats were similar, but what I liked about the ATP Cup is that the way they set up the team bench. Yeah. I don't know how many people, I mean, I, I really liked that. I was a bit, and I've got to say, I was a bit envious of it, you know, because you were able to chat and, and keep a sort of flowing dialogue with the other players, other coaches, and I'm not saying, because I know it's not relaxed when you're out there, it's still intense, but it, it allowed that freedom to talk. And, uh, you know, when I'm sitting there at Davis Cup, I'm literally sitting on a bench, removed from the rest of the, the team, and you're sitting there on your own, on your, basically on your Todd for about 11 hours, 12 hours sometimes, and there's no one to talk to other than perhaps a really unhappy tennis player um, <laughs> sitting next to you every couple of minutes, you know. Um, so I, 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 how did that feel with the, the players and, be, and the coaches being able to chat through them? Actually? Yeah. It, it was, um, for me, that was probably, you know, the standout element of the event. Because uh, for someone who's played Davis Cup for, for a number of years, I don't think I was aware of the Davis Cup rule that the captain is not allowed to communicate with the player in between points. The captain's only allowed to communicate um, at, at the change of ends. Um, in ATP Cup, it's totally different. You can communicate all the time. Um, but as Leon said, to have, you know, maybe the player's individual coach, um, the rest of the team mm. uh, on the bench so that you've got that communication, but quite often banter that's going on. I think that's a huge attraction um, for everyone involved in the event, but also, you know, the, the spectators, the fans watching, because it's, it's the entertainment industry. And we need, to, as Leon was talking earlier, we need to you know, grab our audience. And um, that, was a, that was a huge, huge positive. Yeah. I, I find it fascinating. You get an insight into the personalities of the players who are watching 
in in watching them watch the matches themselves in a way that you wouldn't do when they're in the in the, in the competitive environment. So so Colin quickly Fed Cup um a obviously captain now. I mean what's what's the plans f um post COVID? Have you have you got a date for a first tournament? Yeah, so um yeah, great to be um part of the, the, the Fed Cup setup um for what eighteen months now, although it, it doesn't feel that long because it as as Liam was sort of alluding to with the Davis Cup, we don't play very often. So that's one one of the, the big challenges at the best of times, let alone now with, with, with what's happened is keeping momentum going that, that you build up. Um so it was a, a really successful period um for the Fed Cup team. That you know we played at home for the first time in 26 years in 2019 we were in the, in the group stages group one we held that at Bath University um, that's a format where a number of countries came together in a group um, we managed to get through played the, the playoff and won that as well and from that moment the team really sort of uh, caught fire if you like and it felt like there was a lot more focus on it and and, and it's been much deserved they've just been unfortunate with with draws and um, home and away ties that they've not had that home tie to really showcase what the Fed Cup's about and how many great players we've got. We then followed that up at, at, at the Copper Box um, in April 2019 with a fantastic win against uh, Kazakhstan, where um, you know Katie Bolter and, and, and Joanna Conta really, really you know put front and centre for the British public what they're capable of in a tennis court. And Leon touched on how much it can help players to achieve things on that stage where there's a lot of pressure riding on it. You're playing big matches. It's not just for yourself. It's for your, it really is for your country. And uh, Joe Conte in particular really stepped up, led the team to a great victory there and then went on a month later to make the semi-finals of the French Open where she'd hardly won a match before. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really confident that that belief she gained from, from the Fed Cup helped her to go on that journey. So these are big, big features in, uh, in the tennis world. And as Tim says, hopefully we can, we can bring them together. Um, so unfortunately, we, we, we then went on at the start of this year in February. We had an away tie to Slovakia uh, on clay, lost that one 3-1. We were due to be playing again in April. Um, that was going to be away in Mexico, which would have been a nice uh, nice trip for the team. <laughs> I'm lucky, I'm lucky Flambo. <laughs> Extra 20 yards on the drive at altitude as well. But um, yeah, so uh, unfortunately, that one didn't take place. And uh, yeah, it remains to be seen what's going to happen now. It's supposed to be a momentous year for the Fed Cup tournament had been reformed in the way that the Davis Cup had massively increased prize money, massively increased profile. There was going to be a finals in Budapest, similar to what the Davis Cup has in, in, in Madrid that wasn't able to take place. So we wait and see, but hopefully, you know, the, the momentum that was gained by the GB team, but the Fed Cup as a competition can, can pick up again um, as and when possible. And, and, and we'll get back to business and, and hopefully uh, posting some more wins for, for Great Britain. Great. Okay, and and lastly, then conscious of time, um, you've you've started to to allude to some of those British players in that in um, on the women's side uh, in that answer. So there's quite a few questions coming through about what all this means for for the British game, um, both professional and um, non-professional side of things. So, um, a just to, I mean, questions first on the professional game. Dan Evans, um, Tim, you were working quite a bit with him um, in the ATP Cup. He was in. Quite a vein of form, wasn't he? He's itching to get back. If I can follow the, the the press accounts, I mean, just a quick thing on the on the professional game first so from a from a British side. Yeah, that's right. I mean, obviously, um, you know, Dan played exceptionally well at the beginning of the year, not just in in ATP Cup, but uh, I think he had um, he beat seven top twenty players, and so um, you know, career high ranking, you know, was on, was was on a roll and. Um, you know he's he's desperately keen to get back out there, and when you when you think about the the tennis community, um, you know everybody pretty much is self-employed. So when the players um, cannot play tournaments, they're obviously not earning. But there's a huge support team around that. So if the players are employing a coach, well then the coach won't be earning. The the physios, the trainers, they won't be earning. So. You know, when you're right at the very top and you, you see those, you know, the top 10, top 20 players in the world who are earning millions of dollars, you know, they're, they're fine. But you don't have to move too far down that ladder to, to see how, you know, other players will start to struggle. And, and the ranking system goes down to, you know, sort of 2,300 or something. So um, there are so many people, you know, professional players who want to get back out there, not only because they love the game, 
um, but they want to earn. And so, um, you know, this has, has certainly been uh, challenging. I saw a couple of the questions coming in on the screen. You know, I think it will um, definitely affect the number of, you know, professional players that are, are competing at um, not at tour level, but moving further down to challenge a future level because um, the economics of it um, will not add up. Yeah, indeed. And thank you, because um, we're not going to get through all the questions, unfortunately. Um, Leon, just um, on the, the non-professional game, then, what do you see as any of the changes that are going to come through this for that side of the game? Well, it depends how we define that. I mean, it's, um, you know, in, in, in British tennis, we have obviously the, the players we see at the top of the game that are playing on the main tour, but there's a, a huge amount of, of, of players, whether it's in the junior ranks or whether it's that are trying to become professionals. Um, you know, we've got in Britain, 60 male players, for example, they've got an ATP ranking, you know, um, now, clearly not all of them are going to try to get to the top of the game, but they still want to play. Um, and then behind that, we've got, you know, a lot of players either at UK universities that are playing on, on university scholarships, bursaries, and then a lot of players now that go on to US college, um, mm -hmm. which has been successful for people like Cam Norrie, for example, that went to US college, came out, been a pro. We've, we've seen a lot of doubles players like Salisbury, Dom Inglot, both Skupski brothers come out of US college. So that's a big route. And we've got, you know, the last count playing, playing over there on scholarships is 128 male players alone. Um, that have got a scholarship in the States. So there's, there's a lot of players, and, and that's been a lot of the work that we've, we've been trying to do, you know, if I wear my LTA, you know, men's tennis hat on, is, is trying to get some support for uh, players that are ranked well below where you see the likes of Dan Evans, players that are ranked outside the top 100 all the way down to, you know, 2000s in the world yeah. ranking. How do we help them? There's a finite amount of money, but we've given a little bit of cash support just to, Tied them over the snow, but then also this is where the national competition has been huge and doing a lot of planning around how do we get enough events on. Uh, and the challenges that come with that is the government guidelines only allow um, venues that can operate along pretty stringent protocols and processes. Um, unfortunately, we're seeing um, the start of those events, which will cover probably about 60 men and 60 female players in Britain starting early July. There's actually Three venues. One is our National Tennis Centre. One is in uh, Surrey, uh, a club there, and one is going to be in a, in, in, in Gosling uh, Tennis Centre in Welland Garden City. And they're they're able to host these events uh, for yeah. pretty decent prize money. So we've got more playing opportunities over the whole of July and into August. And as Tim said, the the, the tough bit is not like you're playing in a team. You're it's not just employing your coach. It's for those players that aren't earning millions of dollars, it's your, your flights, your accommodation, your coach's accommodation, your coach's meals. You know, there's, there's all stringing of rackets. Uh, all of these is all your own expense. It's not jumping on a team bus or jumping on a team flight. This is all yours. So there's got to be opportunities over the next or six, seven, eight weeks to help sort of give opportunities for them to earn some money so they can then go off and play internationally after that. Yeah. Nick, can I just add that? Could I just add to that? Mm -hmm. um, yes. It's um, you know we 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 try and sort of stay positive, all of us, I think, and and think about the opportunities. And we we obviously been talking quite a lot about the professional game, um, but the, the amateur game, the recreational game, I, I do think there is an opportunity. And and you know Scott Lloyd, who is the chief executive of the LTA, um, you know, is very aware of that and. You know, given lockdown and social distancing, you know, people to get outside and, and exercise is, is certainly on, on the radar. And, and tennis, I think, fits that bill very, very well. A, a bit like golf, as we were talking about, as we're sort of a few golf addicts here. Um, so in, in, in the previous, um, in the last few months, I think you've seen quite a significant increase in participation in tennis because people want to be outside and, and doing a bit of exercise and, and, you know, participation, making sure the game um, is accessible as, as, as possible, the opportunities are there. Um, you know, hopefully we can take um, a little bit of a silver lining because if we can get more people engaged in the game, enjoying the game, there are definitely, you know, health benefits to that. But, you know, you've got more chance of the better athletes of, of taking up tennis and, and then yep. perhaps moving, you know, towards the top of the game. So 
yeah, participation is, is, is absolutely on the radar as well. And that's a, that's a good point, Tim, because, you know, the club that me and Colin be using, we were a little bit, obviously, uh, later than England to get uh, out of lockdown and, and onto the tennis courts. But, you know, I go on to what's called Club Spark, which is the booking um, uh, portal for, for tennis clubs. You can't get a court for love, no money. You cannot. Mm-hmm. Every, during, everyone's playing tennis, which is absolutely brilliant for our sport. You know, I go down, like I said, I've seen Colin the last few days. Can't get a court. It's mobbed, which is brilliant. And, and it also allows us to tell a bit of a story around tennis, where yep. this perception that it's very much middle class and above. The average cost of a club across Scotland is like 60 pence a day. Mm-hmm. You know, that, wow. you go down and play for a couple of 60p a day, where are you getting that? I know what, how much it costs to send one of my kids on a swimming lesson, certainly not 60 pence. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, or you know, or go to the cinema, whatever it is. But uh, it, it, you get really, really good value for money um, from joining a tennis club. Great. Well, look, thank you because you just done my job for me. Thank you very much, guys. Because I was going to finish, and we are now, I'm afraid, out of time. But I was going to finish by um, just giving a shout out to to that initiative that we're doing with Judy Murray, which I, um, I mentioned at the beginning of today's session. So she she's um, they put together a thing which is called Back to Tennis with Brodies, um, which we've helped to put together. And that's got Andy and Jamie and a whole pile of other professional players, including Collins involved in it as well, showing people some drills and practices and, and routines to get back into the game. So um, eh, there'll be some press this week. So keep an eye out for that. Um, if you if you are inspired about it, then we would obviously encourage everyone to, to take part in it. But um, for now, guys, I'm afraid we are out of time. Thank you very much for taking part. Um, my best wishes um, to each of you for the rest of the lockdown and for the return to tennis. So thank you very, very much. much. Thank, thank you. Very thank much. you. Thank you. Goodbye.